we're back. It's March 11th. Yes, we're back. Um, it's every other Friday in our life where we try and make sense of what's going on in the world. And um, where do you want to kick off, Mark? I think we're going to go to, obviously, the, the topic of the week. I think we, as we left with Doug McWilliams last week, we talked about we thought we'd be in a new world when we got together two weeks later. And uh, it certainly seems like we're in a new world. A lot more information. And we don't have all the great access on the ground. But we thought we would talk about uh, we, our crew has been working very hard on our props. And we're going to talk about Ukraine. But yeah. we're going to talk about second order effects. Yeah, that is what's happening around, say, misinformation, commodities, China, etc. So, and, and where I do you guess, want to take us first? Yeah, how do how do people who are sort of either directly or indirectly, you know, what sort of strategy do they have going forward? And um, we could sort of pontificate over maps and uh, <laughs> pretend to know what we're talking about, where the River Dnieper is, and all this stuff. But the truth no. is. That, yeah, it's funny you brought that up. I've actually watched more videos in the last seven days about the history of Ukraine, which is very complicated. Um, it's been in various maps and territories over 500 years, and um, I still don't have a clear idea of uh, well, the history of it. It's very, very complex. It's like, it's like economics. You ask three, three economists and you get <laughs> four answers. Um, and there is enough narrative on all sides to suit everybody and suit nobody. So on the basis that obviously this war is, is continuing and um, we, we may be seeing a sort of Western view of it, which is that the Russians are struggling a bit and that the Ukrainians are just about hanging on thanks to all sorts of weapons that the West is, um, is sort of forwarding to them. Um, in two weeks' time, may we still be like this or there could, all sorts of scenarios from you know, peace breaking out to World War Three. So, yeah. um, as you said, maybe it's the second order thing that we can uh, we can address a little bit better because when you chuck a really big brick into the pond, the ripple effect on all sorts of other countries and corporations uh, is enormous. I mean, uh, I I sense that a lot of Western companies um, have been quite quick to to sort of join ranks on forms of sanctions or freezing business or pulling out. But there's a sort of glaring exception today, and I just wonder what the conversation is, uh, at Deutsche Bank. Deutsche yeah. Bank decided to keep going. Now, many people have in the past accused Deutsche of being a little too close to the oligarchs and this, that, and the other. Um, but it's quite a statement for you know, uh, a proud German institution um, to to say, no, we're just going to carry on dealing with Russia. Well, yeah, I think what's interesting, so, you know, as you know, professionally, I've spent most of my career working at the intersection of business and politics, mainly around communications and public affairs, and I've been quite blown away about how fast business has moved or how, or how slow they haven't moved. For example, McDonald's is a fascinating choice in the sense – they have over 800 stores there. My understanding, they own 85% of them. They've been there for 30 years. And overnight, they've, they've just left the country. And then you have a Deutsche Bank that is still, you know, servicing their clients. And, oh, by the way, the world is still buying close to a billion dollars a day of various natural resource commodities from Russia while this is all going on. So this is a long way to get to my point. What, what's interesting for me, my understanding of war has really been shaped by popular culture I've watched, you know, a thousand yeah. World War II documentaries. Sure. And I always see war as it's just like dominating everything. But in fact, their life continues in all kinds of different fashions. People still go to sporting events. People still go to commerce. People still trade. Yeah. I've been really struck by that. And um, to your point about how fast or what business should do, I think they're in a real pickle. Yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, like all these things, uh, there's not a clear right answer. I, I think McDonald's is interesting just simply for the, the uh, you know, the sort of icon status they had when they opened their first Moscow um, restaurant in, I'm going to guess, the year. It was very early on, maybe 1991, something like that. Yeah, I know. My understanding is like 90, 91. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they were very early, and a lot of people said, well, you must be mad, and they're all sorts of stories about how they were going to source some decent potatoes for their, um, uh, you know, for their chips. Fries, yeah, no, they're and, fries, Joe, the fries. 
Yeah, no, well, uh, there's already, well, you know, troubles breaking out on this podcast now. Um, <laughs> but we'll we'll put that to one side. Um, yeah, the quality of Russian potatoes weren't up to it and all the rest of it. And the press had a field day when they opened. But I didn't realise what such an extraordinary uh, scale of operation. I know they've got globally, they're a huge operation, but they're not insignificant in Russia. And so that must you know, that mythical person in the street who can't get their burger and other uh, vegetables, um, <laughs> you know, uh, does that impact on them? Do they not even think about it or do they feel a bit grumpy or I don't know. But it, there's a lot of this going on. There's a very interesting article in The Spectator, um, a journalist who's managed to get out of Moscow with a teenage son and um, they must have been on some foreign travel or long-term visa. Uh, suddenly, none of their credit cards work. They couldn't wow. get off, they couldn't get on a flight anywhere. They got a flight. They thought they were flying to uh, Istanbul. Uh, plane uh, got pulled down before uh, got any distance because the Russian government stopped stepped in and stopped flights. And they somehow got to Turkey, and it's not quite in the entire article by train wow. so I mean, these, are, these are kind of scenes out of dr Zhivago. yeah I mean, okay that's a little you know an extreme way of putting it but then there's a lot of that sort of impact but does that count or not i i don't know well i think too getting to your you know point at the beginning like i you know one of my maxims around politics is you know where you sit is where you stand and you know people in the west i've been amazed some of my friends and colleagues that have spent no time thinking about globalization whatsoever, even considering mm -hmm. where Ukraine is or the Black Sea, suddenly become huge experts in the space. And they, they see this like rapidly going to World War III, whereas, you know, possibly this could be done in three or four weeks. People sue for peace. It, it's only been, I'm not trying to discount the, how horrible the situation is, but mm -hmm. it's early days. And to make these draconian statements that we're ending World War III, you've got to pull out all your business, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Um, some of it feels like a little bit of like feel-good nonsense. Well, and very there, short term. You know, there, there there may be some of that, and also, you know, a lot of there's a lot of talk about how how do we kind of um, give uh, Putin an out in all of this. So, you know the. The, the off ramp, yeah. The famous everybody's yeah. saying, "What is the off ramp?" Yeah, well, but also, wh where's the green flag that says that McDonald's could reopen, or that you know Western banks no. can start dealing with Russian banks again? It's, it's not at all clear, and um, I suspect, having looked at it a little bit, when you look at sanctions, even really stiff ones like this, they take an enormously long time to impact. So right. their, their main impact, I would have thought, is going to be on public opinion, and then uh, I'm, you know, Russian public opinion, and then you ask yourself a question: Well, is that a currency worth anything at all? You know, does the Kremlin not give two hoots about Russian public opinion? And I think, again, I'm going to say I don't know. I, I you know, some people say, oh well, the Russians they're very stoic and they went all the way through the Second World War and how horrific it was. But it's a different generation now. It's more of a consumer society. And you recall a couple of weeks ago that uh, Doug McWilliams made the comment that uh, he was surprised how much wealthier Russia was. And it would show, you know, the classic sign was demographics for men, was, you know, lifespan was up 10 years. And there was a definite feeling that there was more wealth. Um, and so, you know, with consumerism, people have got a skin in the game. You know, they yeah. don't they, they don't want to lose their livelihoods or their jobs or the ability to travel overseas. So all the yeah, once you lose, yeah, once you lose access to, uh, you know, Spotify and you can't buy the latest Apple gadgets and you can't watch the Premier League, um, it's a much different world than, you know, Leningrad and World War II. Yeah. So it is interesting. The pressure, you know, it, it's very overt or covert what the, what the Western governments have done to say, you know, I don't have this on confirmation, but just understanding how DC works, I'm sure there's been a lot of private conversations encouraging companies to do the right thing. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. I would assume Deutsche Bank has been encouraged by somebody in the German government not to leave Russia, um, but it's going to be a daily drip. You know, they're going to get they're going to get bad press, bad attention. 
And what yeah, could be a long-term you know, situation? You know, you you know, maybe we've all watched too many spy films or read novels, but you often wonder what back channels there are for things like this. Is there is there a significant reason why Deutsche um, continue business? Not least of which, maybe their credit exposure mm -hmm. to Russia is so phenomenal that if if they pulled it all, they would have such difficulty. The German government would have to come in and bail bail Deutsche Bank out. Now I know that's a recurring story for the last ten years that Deutsche Bank's in in trouble. Right. But, uh, you know the end the end game is is the is the German Treasury. So, uh, you know, again, we don't know. We're on the outside. We don't know the inside. But it, it's very remarkable. But, that no, it is. But I think my instincts around this stuff is that you know things don't happen by accident, especially this high level kind of elite global world, and. We'll have to see how it plays out. Let's go. I think what's interesting, besides you know, kind of like big multinationals moving or not moving, has been the commodities. Um, we saw this week Egypt is not allowing wheat to be exported from their country. The prices of commodities are off the charts. Uh, the nickel market at the London Metal Exchange has been shut down. I think now for the third day running. Yeah. What, I mean, what, the, what's the, your thoughts about that? Well, the graph is vertical. Um, you can take a slightly more nuanced view and said that these commodities prices were starting to move anyhow, because we were starting to see, you know, if we'd done this podcast three months ago, we would have been talking about supply chain problems and, and they haven't gone away, but there has been significant supply chain problems. Um, plus, after the event, I've come to realize that when you have these sort of lockdowns and pandemics and uh, a bit like the plague, um, you tend to have an inflationary event afterwards. I mean, we can roll all the way back to medieval England and the Black Death, and there was a shortage of labor because so many people had died and prices went through the roof. Um, how do we know this? Well, believe it or not, there are wheat and um, various grain prices going back to that period of time. Um, obviously, it's shaky data. It's not the sort of thing you find on Bloomberg, but uh, <laughs> you, can, you can see this effect. So this was underway anyhow, and then you could say that's a demand shock. And now we've got a supply shock that suddenly, you know, we're putting the skids on things or the skids have been put on for us. Um, now, the glib answer is markets always adjust, but of course the adjustment is the price. You know, there is a price where people won't, you know, this sort of famous driving season in the States, Perhaps people won't drive, you know, all the way down the East Coast uh, or do the road trip of a lifetime, uh, you know, Route yeah. 66 and all the rest of it. So the, the market will adjust to a price. Um, and I think that's just the cost we have to bear. Yeah. Again, again, echoing Doug from a couple of weeks ago, this isn't just the cost of the Russians, it's the cost of the rest of us. And we're seeing it in, you know, fuel prices and food, I think, is going to be a big one. Um, you know, just a loaf of bread and pasta and all this type of stuff. Um, it's going to be more expensive. Now, it is wild. The, um, it's almost like this uh, stuff that we take for granted, you know, every day. And um, food, commodities, potash, nickel, lithium, coal, um, you know, they, they power become, modern economies. It's become a sort of pub quiz thing to spot the most unlikely thing you didn't even know about how important it is i have have absolutely no reason or not reason i've no idea to understand this but apparently neon i guess neon gas is really important in the manufacture of semiconductors and three quarters of that comes from russia and the ukraine so wow. you know, everybody's been fretting about semiconductors in taiwan and right suddenly there's something that sort of bites you from behind that, you know, I, I have very few people, unless they're in the industry, would know anything about. And I suspect there's some more of these to come. So this, See, you know, go this, ahead. Shock, this <clears throat> shock is not done for, you know. Uh, yeah, and I think the way you look at this conflict, you know, I mean, we're, like I said, early days in, but at the same time, it's been going on since 2014. Mm. To me, it is really a battle of commodities and kind of the future of the world around, like what you said, semiconductors, the need for uh, neon gas, um, nickel, lithium, the kind of power, if you want any kind of electrical vehicle future. Um, I don't know. Some things 
just because what is being said by people doesn't really might not really be the reason why this yeah, is yeah. happening. And if um, you know, there are plenty of people that thought the U.S. went to war in Kuwait and the first Gulf War, even the second Gulf War over the over oil. So why wouldn't is it? It's not out of the realm of possibility that Russia would go over the war, go to war to control more of uh, Ukrainians' assets and natural resources. Yeah, maybe maybe we have lived in a very comfortable bubble for a very long time. I mean, maybe well over a century where, in general, our resources have been uh, available. Um, you think about it in a practical example in the Second World War that Hitler was pretty much done for when he lost the Romanian oil fields because that was his sole supply of oil. And, you know, no oil, no army, as simple as that. And how the British spent a lot of time uh, in politics and brute force in the Middle East um, 50 years before that to secure oil for, for the Royal Navy. And right. now, going forward, as you say, um, it's, it's security, isn't it? Security of food, security of, of resources, and, and not just controlling them the other end or having a friendly ally the other end. You've got to transport them and all sorts of other issues. And things that um, I, I just go back to the mantra I think we said in the first uh, the first podcast that the world has actually got bigger. You know, it's harder to travel. Yeah, things are slower, and things are more expensive. You know, I right before COVID, we were seeing a couple of airlines talking about doing um, fifty dollar fares across the transatlantic. You yeah. know. The airline, which we're going to do London, New York for, you know, cheaper than taking a train to Edinburgh. And you think, well, hang on. And I, I think that I think that world is completely gone and, and so, you know, not coming No, back. I totally, I think about 2019, like the last half of 2019, I made several trips across the U.S. I made two trips to Europe. Um, I was traveling all the time. No yeah. problem. Easy breezy. <laughs> having yeah. all the time, all the joy in the world. Uh, and then, you know, we hit COVID. Now we get this situation. And yeah, the, the world has gotten much more serious for sure, much more risk adverse or risky in the sense of, um, and I know you've written a lot about this, just how fragile, how we've become, we're so interdependent. Yeah. We really, in some ways, have taken it for granted and um, we're seeing it in real time. Yes. And I think, you know, rebuilding all that sort of network of seamless connections and everything could take a very long time i mean you i think um you certainly tweeted about it i think it may have come up as a map on one of the last podcasts the lovely um map about airspace right that, you know everybody's banning everybody else as to where they can fly and i think you identified that the place to be is anchorage in alaska because pretty much <laughs> yeah. everybody's Pretty much everybody's going to have to land there and refuel and all the rest of it. So, how the hell do we buy a, a concession in Anchorage Airport? You know, and th this would have, well, it seems kind of a bit funny now, but it's actually quite serious because, you know, flying from London to Tokyo now is is real grief. You yeah, know? and that must have an impact. Must have. Yeah, an any kind of friction generally will have yeah irritation, friction, and. It's going to be interesting for me to see how, you know, politicians play this out, you know, how they communicate it. And it's also these, these kind of numbers, the price of the loaf of bread. We all know that, you know, we've all seen politicians trip over, you know, do you know the price of a gallon oh, of milk? And, this was George Bush Sr. when he didn't know the price or something. In the yeah, season. exactly. And, uh, yeah. you know, Margaret Thatcher, you know, because yeah. she grew up above the shop, you know, new, and then like everybody understands the price, the price of petrol and fuel and, yeah. Uh, it's going to be interesting to play how this gets communicated out. And uh, what you said, too, I think the second and third tier, like these emerging markets who are buying all kinds of goods and services, trading in dollars, but also importing a lot of food products, you know, it, we could see some pretty shaky stuff happen here in a few months' time. Well, I, you, you could also see that people say they're not going to get their, um, you know, little luxuries. So, for example... A lot of green vegetables in the UK come from Kenya. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of environmentalists have screamed for years, well, this is mad. You know, you're growing green beans and peas in Kenya and you're shipping them to London and then sticking them on a truck and we should go local and all the rest of it. But funnily enough, I think the market's going to intervene and say, well, it's got so expensive to do that. 
people won't buy it and Kenyan farmers are kind of stuck. Um, I think Kenya are also a very, very big uh, grower of flowers. Um, again, in this part of the world, we always, you know, years gone by would have associated it very much with uh, low countries, sort of Holland and Belgium for doing a lot of flower growing, but a, an enormous amount of flowers come from Africa. And you can see people who are suppliers and growers and their livelihoods are in trouble. Yeah. And I think when those people become poor is when you get political trouble because, you know, they've got a little bit of wealth and they, they've got a little bit of sort of political nous. They kick up a big stink about it and say, you know, the government's got to do something. Well, and maybe, these, you know, some governments can't. Yeah. And we're talking about products. The margins aren't that massive, you know, where the slightest increase of fuel, you yeah. know, uh, flying distances, uh, less shipping space. Here's a number I heard. This may be inflated, but basically 20 to 30 percent of all the merchant marines, all the sailors that move this stuff are Ukrainian and Russian. Like there's a huge really? population of, right. of workers in that space that are, uh, you know, driving freighters and getting moving products around mm -hmm. the world that, you know, may be offline well, as there's, well. There's been a sort of background story that has um, uh, always been going on in COVID, but never got a lot of reporting of how a lot of these crews have, have, have been abandoned effectively because they've they the whole supply chain jam up has got ships in the wrong part of the world or embargoed or the you know there have been a huge number of issues around whether the crew are you know vaccinated and all of that stuff. Right. So anything like that is just gonna make things worse. So this is turning into another very cheerful episode of our <laughs> podcast. Isn't it? Let's keep up the cheer with our next topic. Anti-Russia. Yeah, um, um, yeah, we've got yeah. a crazy story here. I'll go first on this one. There's a, yeah. a Philharmonic Orchestra in Cardiff in Wales. Who are, Is it a good Philharmonic? Do we know anything about the... I was not familiar that Cardiff had a Philharmonic, but... No, I was somewhat amazed, I must say. But anyhow, they've, they've, got, they've got quite a bit of publicity by saying they're going to... Uh, uh, they're not going to play Tchaikovsky's 1812. And for those of our listeners or viewers who are not uh, classical music types, of course, a, a key part of that piece of music is, in fact, the Russian national anthem towards the end as a uh, sort of symbolizing overcoming Bonaparte. But uh, I, I actually think it's a stupid and actually completely the wrong thing to do. We can't, you know, people say, oh, I'm not drinking Russian vodka anymore. Well. Maybe you've been drinking too much, if you think like that. I think it's a bad idea. I mean, let's be anti-Putin. Let's be anti the goons who, who you know, for a large part of um, the last 20 years have stolen money hand over fist from, from the Russian economy. And, uh, you know, that makes sense. But the idea that, you know, we, you know, people should boycott the Russian tea rooms in New York or something. In fact, they should do the exact opposite. They yeah. Should exact opposite no we've had a very um well here in dc there's a famous uh, vodka bar called the russian house right. and i always assumed it was run by the uh, kgb but in fact it has an american owner and it's been vandalized and this guy really? you know he's, it's a small business it's just a small restaurant tour yeah. um one of the most famous hockey players in the national hockey league is alex Ovechkin, who plays here in washington dc um he played in edmonton this week and there's a lot of Ukrainians that had settled there in Canada, and he was booed when he entered the ice. And um, there's imagery on his social media of him and Putin together. And um, yeah. of course, he's come out against the war, but you know, it, it, he's still associated. And um, getting back to how fast and quickly this has moved, and this idea of freedom fries, like not drinking vodka. You know, I've heard of stories bartenders not serving Moscow mules anymore. I mean, some of it is just so silly but it's also a reminder of how humans are compelled to want to get involved and help out and do something also, also it's kind of a a sign of impotence a little bit you know if that's all you're capable of doing why bother to do it and yeah. i actually think i do actually think it we should be supporting russians as individuals i know a few people in moscow not very many my last time i was in moscow was in 2014 i think and I was very struck by um, uh, 
the people I met, and they they weren't open about it, but over a beer after work, would say that Putin was not popular in Moscow. Yeah, I can't see him at, being popular in Moscow. Yeah, you know, if you look at the voting patterns, he gets all the votes from people out in the middle of nowhere who think he's a national hero. People yeah. are kind of more engaged in international markets and dare one say the real world or the, the wider world. Uh, you know, and not at all keen on him. And that was, well, that was eight years ago. And I can't imagine he's, you know, got any better. Far worse. Yeah. Than... And it would seem the Russians that we're dealing with, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, in London or New York or Washington, yeah, have a much more worldly view. Um, but this idea of ostracizing them, one of the most shameful episodes of U.S. history is during World War II, we interned, you know, thousands of Japanese Americans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's shameful. And I'm actually quite shocked that the Biden administration hasn't come out and said, you know, hey, America, you know, let's have, let's be more sensible. Like, look, the bigger thing. And after 9-11, I mean, famously, George W. Bush, you know, went to a mosque and yes. there was a sense of like, hey, we don't have a problem with this religion or these people. We have a problem with these specific terrorists. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised that hasn't been said in the West. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know any leaders said, hey, I let's just put imagine that there are kind of bigger things in the intray. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, there's all this talk this week about chemical weapons. But on a slightly night lighter note, but still in this angle, um, are you going to be making a bid for Chelsea Football Club? Well, I hope to be, yeah. And uh, now it's even sweeter because apparently uh, Abramovich, who loaned the club $2 billion, will waive mm -hmm. that. He's not asking for that. Um, yeah, happy to be part of any kind of consortium. Well, this, uh, is what I, this is what I call the Richard III tactic, where in Shakespeare's Richard III, he gets knocked off his horse and surrounded by his enemies, and he says, my kingdom, my kingdom for a horse. Well, a horse, you know, one horse in return for a kingdom seems an unusual <laughs> exchange rate. And um, you could say this is, um, you know, Let's invent a number. Let's say Abramovich is worth ten billion dollars, some sort yeah. of number like that. Well, if he gets out with five hundred million, he's not exactly going to be worried about about utility bills. And he's an Israeli passport holder, and he'll just slink off to. I, you know, he's much more likely to pop up in Israel than he is in Russia, I think. Um, and I think you know a lot of that money. I who knows quite where it goes when it gets frozen. I mean, it's going to be a lawyer's paradise, all of this again. But, well, I think you're spot on. I mean, I remember at the beginning of this, Chel like, Abramovich wanted to drop this team within like days, you know, and I've, I was talking to some friends around M&A &A and I was, you know, I was like, I have no idea how M&A works, but it seems that it has to take longer than 48 hours. And getting back to like back channels, I'm sure there are folks in the UK government that are like, we're not putting this deal through. Uh, but yeah, the legality of it, the, the, somebody owns these assets and governments just can't take well, them some, over. Sometimes assets get frozen for very many years. So I've kind of changed what I have on, the, the, on, on my wall here, but I used to have a Chinese bond, which was payable in uh, 1918. And um, I haven't written a stiff letter to presidency yet, <laughs> but I know he's 104 years late on repaying it. Um, so some things, you know, I could call it an asset if I wanted to. I could cling on to the piece of paper that I still own Chelsea Football Club, but in reality, I don't. But I don't know what the legal um, way forward is. Does it kind of get sold off and the proceeds go to the British government? Lord only knows. Um, you, in previous disputes, believe it or not, this sometimes has ended up um, with the United Nations sorting out um, some stranded assets as, as well. Wow. Right, yeah. That's interesting. Uh, well, there's, there's loads of stories about gold between France and, and Germany. Um, the Germans took, uh, or the Prussians took, French gold in 1870. The French got it back in 1918. Uh, Mr. Hitler very kindly uh, took it back in 1939, and the, the Allies got it in 1945. And there were such huge disputes over um, not a huge amount of gold, but uh, a number of bars of gold, um, that in the end uh, they gave it, as everybody agreed, that it'd have to be owned by the United Nations. I don't know what they've done with it. They've stuck it in a bank somewhere. <laughs> Maybe it's you in those uh, Deutsche Bank vaults in uh, Moscow. Exactly. But you can't put a football club in a, in a, in a bank, so um, it's going to be interesting to see. 
Well, I think you're right about one group of people that will win regardless are the uh, attorneys, lawyers, uh, you know, tax accountants. They will, uh, they will be busy. And that is a good segue to our next topic, which hopefully is a little bit lighter and more friendly. Our president over here released a memo around crypto, an executive order, an EO, executive order, Biden's crypto executive order. Um, I'll go first, which I think is interesting. Just as an aside, I have some friends that work at uh, the Commodities Future and Trade Commission, CFTC, and also yeah, the yeah, Security yeah. Exchange Commission. And I said, hey, were you guys working on this? And uh, they said, no, this is some kind of White House project. But, the, and you'll appreciate this, the bureaucrats are already at war deciding who is going to have oversight of digital currency. Yeah, so in some ways, this that. is uh, what this is all about. Who's going to regulate this thing? You can see the control of the currency wants it. The Fed wants exactly. it. Exactly. There needs to be a special congressional committee that oversees it all. Um, so it's interesting, isn't it? Because this is another innovation that's come from bottom up. Yeah. It gets to a certain size where the top thinks, hang on, we've got to step in here. and um, <laughs> 100%. You know, and, and put in the rules. And when you put in rules, we need lawyers to argue over the rules and rewrite rules and off we go again. I mean, I think there are two elements to, to cryptocurrencies. I've always been, uh, I would say, really pretty skeptical, if not very skeptical about them. Um, they may have, well, no, I think they do have a role in what you may call the very boring architectural plumbing of payments. Um, the idea they're gonna supplant the dollar, I think is pie in the sky. Because why in the world would Uncle Sam let that happen? And there's a very easy way that Uncle Sam can stop it from happening is he demands <laughs> you pay your tax in dollars. As long as you keep the taxes in the currency, you control the currency. Simple as that. The and U.S. government, yeah, the U.S. government is undefeated. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they kind Uncle of, Sam cannot be beat. No, because well, he's writing the rules, he's the referee, he decides where the lines <laughs> on the ground go, and you're going to come on and think you're going to kick him in the shins. Well, good luck. Uh, and there's, a, there's, a, there's an element that we all like the idea, let's be independent of big government and all the rest of it. So the plumbing side, the blockchain side of this, kind of makes a lot of sense. And we talked last time about SWIFT. And yeah. SWIFT is kind of a clockwork train system. It's a very, very elderly form of transfer payments it kind of works um but it's it's certainly not you know state-of-the-art or leading edge it's it's bleeding edge and um there's a need for a new form of plumbing and blockchain and all of that makes sense now the step on from that um it's this idea of the sort of um that see i've got the initials right here uh, cent central bank centralized currencies, I think they're going to call it. Yeah, them. CBDC. Correct. Oh, CBDC. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm missing a D. There's CBD, which is good for relaxing. And then there's CBDC, which is good for currency. <laughs> well, there was a, there was a quote. Um, in fact, I tweeted it, and you may be able to find the link and, and, and put it on the show notes. Um, uh, the general manager of an outfit I used to work for, the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, very senior. Uh, central banker, chap called Augustin Carstens, who used to be governor of the Bank of Mexico, in a sort of, it's a clip, so it would be nicer to see a larger part of the interview, but he is lauding the fact and um, hailing the fact that now central banks would be able to monitor and trace every single payment, you know, through this system. And, you know, one half of one says, well, that'd be quite good for sorting out Russian oligarchs. But equally, the dystopian view is, do we go to the, uh, do we go to a world where the central bank just takes 10% of my money away? They can well, just pitch me off. Yeah, I'm in the same camp with you. Like, I, there's no way, like, I actually, the 2001 campaign I worked for the Tories, William Haig, yeah, they actually find this. Their whole one of their messages was save the pound. You know, like they're like we're never right. Yeah. So like governments are never going to get rid of their currency. A hundred percent. China, you know, is going to control their currency. People are going to control their currency. So that is full stop problem. But the underlying technology, I think, is super interesting. You know, how you finance it. You know, tokenization, getting more people involved in investments. This is all really interesting stuff. But as you rightly say, somebody's got to regulate it. And whether it, you 
whether it, someone's going to govern it, whether it's like this committee of your friends and pals that you trust or the U.S. government, mm-hmm. probably a government probably makes more sense. To your point, though, about getting uh, cash quicker, one of the and there could be some dystopian stuff, but getting back to COVID, you know, instead of right now, we got to send out checks to everybody, right? Any kind of economic relief the U.S. government does. But if you had a digital system in place, it would seem to me that with some, you know, bits and some code, you could drop a thousand bucks in everybody's account much quicker. I mean, there, yeah, there are no, some positive applications here. It's only that because you live in this wild world of where you still write I think in American law they're promissory notes rather than bills of exchange. But you're, you're, you're firmly, you know, you're you're firmly uh, in the same system as George Washington with this. I mean, it's just <laughs> extraordinary. Um, but there, there's a point in that, you know. Let's go for this sort of um, George Orwell world where everything is digital money, and Big Brother or the government or the central bank can see every single payment. I think people get around that in a, about two minutes flat. I can, yeah. I can write a paper promissory note to you, and then I promise to pay you in three months' time on a certain date, and you take it to a third party that we are both relaxed about, and that third party says, well, I'll give you 90% of the value now. Uh, it could be in goods or services, and yeah. I'll, settle up, I'll settle up with Gerald Ashley in 90 days' time. So I, I'm not certain that these strangleholds work. But you know, I, I find it slightly alarming, and this is going to sound a bit left wing. But I find when it's slightly <laughs> alarming when we'll put a, a parental notice for your left wing uh, yeah, diatribe. Yeah, you're yeah, about well, to no, drop. You, you know, it's, well, it's not very left wing. But it, unelected central banking bureaucrats wanting to control our money. Um, none of this has appeared in any sort of electoral manifesto. There's been no discussion about any of this at all. Uh, it's just no, it, imposed from top down again. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, and we'll put this in the show notes. Um, so Gary Gensler, who's now the SEC chair, um, he taught it. He came from Goldman. Surprise. Goldman, GS, Goldman, Government Sachs, right? He worked at Goldman as an actual partner back in the day, took some time off, uh, did some stuff with Obama, I think. And then he taught a course at MIT up in uh, Massachusetts yeah. on digital currency, and it's it's open source. It's freely available. I think there's 24 lectures. I've actually done four of them. It's really quite fascinating. He's very middle of the road government type, but you know, he's like, here's in some ways, he's like, here's the history of money. Here's where this could go. It's a great lecture if you want to do a deep dive in the space. Um, oh, well, stick, some, stick some links in the show notes because that yeah. sounds very good. But I think you need to under yeah, I think what you said, you have to fully appreciate that there are bureaucrats that want to sort this stuff out, you know, um, that want to be well, part of the process. It's neat and tidy. I mean, again, sort of jumping around topics, but we've got the insanity in the UK of of trying to allow um, Ukrainian refugees into the country. Yeah. Well, the, the, the sheer plethora of box ticking is mind boggling. And but it's the bureaucratic mindset to say, look, there are all these forms, so I'm sorry, you've got to fill them out. And, you know, down to stupid things like whether it should be in blue ink or black ink, and then, oh, well, it's whether the machine can read it and all this stuff. But these guys never get rid of stuff. They only ever <laughs> grow it. And for a perfect yeah. reason, because it keeps them there. You know, don't, don't, don't solve a problem if your job relies upon the problem still being there. And um, that's something called Shirky's principle. Um, uh, we can put a link up for that. And you know, you do not create the light bulb that lasts for a thousand years, right? And bureaucrats <laughs> will never, ever cut mm-hmm. bureaucracy. They just won't. Which is <clears throat> tough to have conversation with these crypto maximalists because you know you're like, dude, you're living in a utopian dream world. It sounds great, but the reality is. There are bureaucrats yeah, I mean, that, are, yeah, that aren't going to give up this power. But it's all quite funny, isn't it? You know, um, Mr. Zuckerberg wants me to join his metaverse, so I don't think I'm probably the demographic he's looking for. Um, but nevertheless, say I was enthused to do so. Funnily enough, he would like me to pay him in dollars. Funny yeah. enough. And um, if I was allowed to pay him Bitcoin, I wonder what's the very first thing he does sells the Bitcoin and turns it into dollars. 
So it's the old rule in life, you know, don't watch what people say, watch what they do and follow the money. So plenty of plenty of interesting stuff around blockchain and payment systems and all the rest of it, but there's no utopian dream world of crypto, I don't think. Not yet. Not yet. No, but I, yeah, never, but say, I... never say never. Never say <laughs> never. If you were, let me ask you, if you were to make a prediction, you want to make a little prediction mm-hmm. around the first G20 nation you think that will issue a central bank, C, what am I saying? Central bank digital currency, a CBDC, who would you reckon? Do you know, I think Britain might do a sort of wholesale version. I mean, the chance... Really? You think they're going to... They'll be at the forefront? They might might do, but I... You know, it's being dubbed the Britcoin, but I think it it might be one of those innovations that gets talked about that doesn't happen, a bit like, you know, Chinese renminbi yuan being cleared in London and how we get... You know, I think you can clear it, but it just doesn't happen. Do you, um, so you think there's pressure in London that uh, the UK go first and the city in London and all well, that? Well, like, there's, there's, there's a very big fintech operation. Yeah. And a lot of fintech firms, and people might dump on me for saying this, to me, they're basically financial IT outfits calling themselves banks. And what they really do is make much more effective use of payment systems whether it's in a single currency, foreign exchange, whatever. Yeah, and they buy no marble. They buy, yeah. uh, you know, they don't have to buy any office space. Yeah, exactly. There's no marble. You know, they're not really running loan books and all this type of stuff. They're not banks, really. Um, but there could be a lot of pressure from there. That's a big growing uh, business in London. There's more going on in London than the rest of um, continental Europe. Um, I don't doubt the states have got some very big uh players in that area as well so i don't think it's going to come from one of the minnows who wants to catch up i think it's much more likely to come from one of the big boys that's got some form of uh, infrastructure that they would like to exploit further but i think it's going to be um i i'm I'm not certain it's going to be earth shattering if it happens that may be a horrendously wrong prediction by (laughs) I don't think I think the U.S. is going to take some time like this. um, Any proper legislation in the U.S. takes 10 to 15 years. Mm. And we're so early in this process. So, you know, I can't see I think there'll be plenty of white papers, think tanks. You know, I'm sure there'll be some books written on it. But I think it's going to be a smaller economy. I mean, this is a total guess, but like a Sweden or some kind of Nordic country that, you know, maybe can move quicker. But I like your prediction about the U.K. I mean, the U.K., this could be, you know, a bold statement from Ruzi Shunak and, uh, you know, Boris Johnson to say we want to be part of this at the forefront. If you want to, if you want to take, I, I, it's not a G20 country, I don't think. No, I'm sure it isn't. But if you want to take a wacko one, how about Estonia? Because Estonia has got yeah. a huge uh, internet infrastructure, uh, yeah. uh, big time. And they, 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 they've got a big claim to being the most... Um, internet savvy government and, yeah. and, and all the rest of it so, i think you're only looking at uh, just over a million people in estonia too yeah. we're not talking a yeah. huge you know so but uh, all right watch this space there you go watch this space all right we're back for our favorite segment our final segment what were these cards are oh. these will probably end up in a museum as well i'm gonna say that that they absolutely reinforce your um, high-tech status. I think. <laughs> exactly. This is, uh, yeah, have you seen, this is my digital token. I'm trading this. If you want to buy this well, it's NFT. It's a flexible medium, right? You can, yeah. you, can I'm happy read, to... you can read it out. You can rub it out. You can do it in different colors. I'm happy to sell this in any currency, preferably yeah. Canadian, the Canadian I'm Luna. Certain, I'm not certain about the uh, font, you know, which one that is. Is it the Ross font or... Uh, by the way, yeah, as a side story, my, my handwriting is horrible, which is tragic because my mom was a first grade teacher for many years. I bought the Remarkable 2 tablet, right? This like device. I was like, yeah. oh, I'm going to be great, take notes. My writing is so horrendous that the machine uh-huh. could not deal with it. It was like, so I sold the device. It's a wonderful tool. I think it's a Norwegian company, uh, the Remarkable 2 tablet, but um i had to sell it my uh my hieroglyphic writing could not keep the machine was overwhelmed the processing power was not there 
So it um, probably was trying to find the appropriate Arabic for. <laughs> yeah. So. So we're on. We're on. Watching. We're on uh, reading and watching. What we're reading and watching this week? Well, we're we're reading or rereading this one. Yeah. Um, everybody can see that, and it is the uh, origin of financial crises, keeping up the. Uh, the, the whole theme of how, you know, everything's in crisis. It's written by a guy called George Cooper, who I, I've got to know. Actually, I bought the book before um, I met George. And in fact, I sit on the same board as him on a, on a city investment um, uh, firm. And it's a very good, um, not overly detailed, there's a bit of unpleasant mathematics at the end, if you like that sort of thing. But it's a very good explanation of, why we seem to get into the boom and bust cycles and uh, yeah. you know, why do we repeat and do the same thing time and time again. And he identifies um, a, a lot of key factors and um, he's a guy worth um, people following um, who knows what he's talking about. So that that's a reread from my, um, uh, from my book case. I love it. Going back to the library for answers for today's Yeah, questions. I know. I, I'm, I'm, it's good. Well, I'm saving money in this austerity times. So I'm not buying any more books. Um, you, and, you know, you do forget what's in books after a while, and sometimes it's quite good to go back and reread bits or all of them. Um, and in terms of viewing, I think the film's been out a couple of years um, now, but there's a quite a good Cold War thriller. Here we go again, Cold War, <laughs> uh, called The Courier. Uh, it's on Netflix. It's been issued in the UK last couple of weeks in Netflix, so I don't know if that's a global release or how it works. Um, starring Benedict Cumberbatch, about a guy who I vaguely had heard of because he's slightly before my time uh, or when I was too young to follow these things, a, a guy called Greville Wynn. And Greville Wynn was, um, he was an ordinary sort of high-level traveling salesman in engineering had a lot of clients in Moscow and uh, the Soviet bloc in those days. He gets approached by MI5 to pick up documents from a guy who is probably quite well known, but may have got forgotten, a chap called Oleg Penkovsky, who had a lot of the had a lot of access to the documentation on um, the Soviet plans in Cuba. And it's at the time of the Soviet um, Cuban missile crisis. So oh, wow. So it's got lots of echoes of what's going on. And if you're, if you're optimistic, well, it all comes out well in the end. And if you're worried to death about things now, you'll find plenty of really worrying sort of parallels. But it's a, it's a good film to watch. The West always wins, Joe. The, right? the Korea. At least, at least, no, I was just saying the West always wins. At least in, oh, uh, I see. Yeah, well, at, least in Holly, at least in Hollywood. Yeah, well, that's... that's um, that's uh, survivorship bias. We forget all the things that have gone wrong. <laughs> of course. But yeah, so I, a... I've been trying to, uh, I haven't been doing much reading. I've been watching uh, The Dropout on Hulu, which is a story right. about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, which I kind of knew the story, and, but this is a deeper dive. Um, but the, the acting performance by this actress, Amanda Seyfried, is off the charts. It's fantastic. Uh, it's episodic. You know, it has all the craziness of Silicon Valley, ambition, um, fraud, you know, greed. It's super interesting. Uh, Larry Ellison even makes a cameo. Not the actual Larry Ellison, but um, so check that out. It's pretty good, the dropout. And then the other show just dropped this morning. I watched, already watched two episodes. The Drive to Survive, which is on Netflix, about Formula One racing behind the scenes. Well, it's behind the scenes. It's episodic. They they recap the the previous season of the Formula One racing. Um, right. you know, I love the Formula One, Monaco. You know, all the egos. Growing up in the Motor City, the Formula One race actually came to Detroit a few times, which the right. uh, you know the posh European drivers hated because it was a street course. And you know, Detroit is a bit rough and tumble. Mm -hmm. But um, it's done. It's done by this outfit of Australia. I think the production company is, and even if you're not into motor racing, they've really done a great job. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. drama, the behind the scenes, and uh, making engineering and uh, all these egomaniac auto racers interesting characters. So the drive to survive it dropped this morning. It's ten episodes. I'm two in, so uh, you know I'll probably Sounds. binge it over the weekend. Sounds a good recommendation. And then that just leaves us for the all important uh, commercial message of Rye Italia. 
and there we have it there you go i was i was confident your, your graphics would be ready we st i still haven't heard anything have you no i i just imagine that they're drafting an epically complex uh yeah, contract. It involves large amounts of dollars rather than bitcoins. <laughs> Let's hope so. Or lira. I remember I uh, I went to this is years ago. They were still on the lira, so you know the exchange rate was insane. It was everything was like a hundred thousand lira. It didn't you know? It just didn't make any sense. You yeah, couldn't no, figure out what the hell anything was worth. You just gave all your money. It's just, just like, too many. It's just too many noughts. They yeah, didn't do just, what the French did after the, the Second World War. The French dropped two noughts. So, um, you know, if you had... Oh, is that the history? Yeah. I didn't know, yeah, okay. Old francs, it suddenly woke up the next morning and it was 10,000 new francs because <laughs> they had exactly the, the same problem. And you would meet elderly French people who claimed to be millionaires because they'd confused their old francs with what were now modern new francs. And, of course, they had 20,000 bucks, not 2 million or whatever it was. It's too bad the uh, the Italians in, in, you know developed crypto first. I don't know. Maybe they uh, they'd still be out. Of, maybe they'd be independent out of the EU. Well, you know, you know there's, there, there are kind of three sets of accounts, aren't there? In, in, a, in Italian accounting, there's the there's the public accounts, there's the accounts you show the tax man, and then there are the real accounts. So uh, you know where crypto sits in all of that. <laughs> all of that <laughs> Well, that's a good ending. Yeah, I guess you're gonna have to have a fourth account, right? Where's the Where's the digital assets? Yeah. All right, buddy. Good chatting with you. Um, we'll be back in two weeks, the 25th, with possibly a guest joining yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Our crack team is on it. Our uh, producers are out there reaching. And if you, hey, we can even say if you're up for, it, if you feel like you can join this podcast, reach out to us. We'll put you on. If you can do anything to raise our game, we'd be very grateful, basically. <laughs> okay. All right, that was great. Yes, we're done. See you soon. Take care.